So continuing on with our outstanding guest series, our, excuse me, our outstanding guest speaker series, today the TNCC Library Open Genealogy Lab is proud to present De Deborah Basham. Deborah serves as the staff archivist for the West Virginia State Archives at the Department of Arts, Culture, and History, and has held the position since 1984. Among the many program areas uh, that she works are the archives collection, the historical state records, manuscripts, photographs, and special collections. She also oversees the virtual research records project on the agency website and works with records for the West Virginia Veterans Memorial. Born in Mississippi and raised in Pensacola, Florida, she has a BA in history uh, and a MA in history from the University of Delaware with a certificate in museum studies. While a member of the archive staff, she has also served as the West Virginia caucus representative for the Mid-Atlantic Regional Archives Conference, as well as a member of the fall 1987 and co-chair of the spring 2009 local arrangements committees for meetings held in Charleston. She was also one of the founding members of the religious archivists, uh, excuse me, yeah, archivists of the greater, and pronounce, I'm probably gonna pronounce this wrong, Kanawha Valley, and was involved in their work until the group dissolved. So without further ado, I would like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Deborah. Thank you. Uh, it, it's actually pronounced Kanawha, but just about everybody who has not lived here or known that makes it Kanawha or Kanawha as you did. Uh, it's an Indian term for the river that flows here through Charleston and uh, flows down into the Ohio River at Point Pleasant. So uh, it, our, our building, our Capitol complex is on Kanab Boulevard. And so when we're spelling out our address for folks that want to write us, it always takes a few minutes. It's, it's an odd term. So let me see if I can make my PowerPoint work here. I don't do this enough. Yes, it does. This is Virgil Lewis, who is our first state historian and archivist. Our, our collections and our history go back to 1890 to the Historical and Antiquarian Society. But in 1905, we actually became a part of state government, and Virgil Lewis was appointed the first state historian and archivist. Uh, so we are basically about 115 years old as a state agency. We were our own department in the beginning. Then we became a division of what was then the Department of Culture and History, now we are a section within the Department of Arts, Culture, and History. So the name has kind of kept changing over the years, but uh, you know we have continued our collecting emphasis. This is a, a picture of when the archives collection was in the old Capitol Annex. We started out in the main Capitol building when we were created in 1905, and because they were running out of space in that building, which had been built in 1885, they built an annex building nearby and we were one of the things that got moved out, which turned out to be a blessing for us because the Capitol burned in 1921 and we were out of it. So all of our collections, the museum collections, they're also a part of our agency. We were not in the building, so we were spared. And that was a good thing. Uh, we now are in the Cultural Center, which is a building on the grounds of the Capitol complex. It was built in, we, well, it was opened in 1976. And actually looking at it from this angle, we are on the right hand side of the building and basically uh, the archive section takes up the top two floors, the first floor with our library and offices, and then some of us are also down in the basement area as well. Uh, this is a view of our library. We've, uh, we've rearranged the tables a few times since then, but what we keep down in the main library for researchers tend to be the things that get used the most by genealogy researchers. We have our census indexes. We have our family histories. We have our compilations of cemetery records. We have our county histories. And over the years, we have moved a good chunk of our Civil War books down there as well because there is so much interest in Civil War research. Uh, we have microfilm reading, and we're sort of in that transition like a lot of libraries, I suspect. We still have some of the older style readers, as you can see in the left-hand view, but we're getting more of the view scans and the more digital type things as well these days, where you can save something to a stick, or you can still print it, depending on your, your uh, interests there. Uh, our microfilm room, this sort of shows one half of it. We have county court records in the middle section that were shot by the Genealogical Society of Utah back in the late 60s, 70s. And then they came back to West Virginia in the late 80s, early 90s and picked up some more records they had not done the first time. But we also have newspapers. We try to get every newspaper published in West Virginia, whether it's a daily or a weekly, and microfilm it. 
And while we don't have everything from the old copies, we have a fair number going back quite a ways. And so, for instance, if we're doing research in the Civil War period, our capital is in Wheeling, and we do have the Wheeling Intelligencer for that period. So we can see what's going on with those with those times. We still actively microfilm ourselves with our current papers. I don't know how much longer we'll be continuing to do that. We certainly hope it's going to be a while longer, uh, as long as we can keep the cameras going and buy the microfilm. We have two floors of storage uh, up above us. Uh, this is our third floor where we have the remainder of the book collection that's not down in the main library. And then I, my manuscript collections are housed up here, part of, our, part of our AV collection. And back behind us in an angle you can't see, we have our state documents collection, which are anything published by a state agency or group, and our periodicals, um, some other odds and ends of different things of that nature. Uh, this is our fourth floor. And so up here I have what we call the archives collection, state and county records. Uh, but I also have special collections. Part of our photograph collection is up here, part of our audiovisual collection. And then I have a lot of, we have maps, blueprints, oversized materials like that as well. And so, for instance, here you see these very large books on the left. Those were land tax books that were kept by the state auditor's office. Uh, they're interesting for researchers to use. We have found over the years that the better versions of that are the ones that were actually maintained in the county by the sheriffs because they are the tax collectors for the local counties, and they're the ones that are more apt to have interesting notations and things added to them. Uh, I mentioned we have an audiovisual collection, a news film collection. These are some shots of some of the cans of film that we actually still have, 16-millimeter uh, Film there, I don't think there's any eight millimeters showing up in here, but we have them from several television stations around the state. And so if there's a story, a historical story, our AV archivist can go back, see if he can find it, make a transfer of it, and then they can use it in a, a newscast or in a documentary. He also has some two inch video, which we don't have the capacity to play in house. These actually came to us from West Virginia Public Broadcasting, uh, some things that they were shooting. We have a uh, three-quarter inch videotape, which a lot of the stations went to. Then they went to a mini uh, format of a tape. And of course, now I think pretty much everybody's saving things on DVDs. So we've really had to transition over the years with the formats on that. It's, it's a good thing sometimes, and it's a, a nightmare sometimes to keep all the equipment running to play all this stuff back. Uh, audio recordings. We have a theater in our building. We record, uh, the agency records everything that goes on there. We have different festivals, concerts and such, and so we have those reel-to-reel uh, -reel recordings as well. Of course, now again, that's all digital when it gets to us. This is a shot of our homepage, and it has a lot of things that you can link to from it, and, and this is sort of the upper third of it where you can see latest news, uh, like the fact that we're only open for appointments starting July 13th. Like everybody else, we were shut down for about four months. Um, but this is the top of our home page. This is sort of the middle where we put up exhibits on different topics. And, of course, this year being the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, uh, one of our staff members had worked up a very nice exhibit on this and had been planning to do a lecture on it until, of course, we closed. You can click on the introduction to Western Virginia Archives and History and watch a short video clip on some of the things that we have here. And then we have different categories of records depending on what you're wanting to look for here that you can click on. The State Archives takes you to a page that will explain some of our different holdings. History Center is useful if you're trying to find out some information about the state. Uh, from a genealogy standpoint, probably the birth, deaths, and marriages databases is the most used, and I'm going to get into that in a little more detail further on. But there are things for teachers, uh, some of our exhibits and such, just different things. It's got our address, uh, our telephone number, so different kinds of things that folks can use to explore our site. Um, other things that we do as a section, we're responsible for the State his Highway Historical Marker Program. And that was started back in the 30s, and they are actually, the older, they are cast aluminum. The things are very heavy, and we are still putting them up. We had just celebrated our sesquicentennial, our 150th anniversary back in 2013. And as part of that, the state came up with some money, and we were putting up 160 new markers 
scattered in all of our counties. And so you see there's a separate listing there for the sesquicentennial markers. We are in the process of actually updating and redoing our highway marker book that we put out, I don't know how many years ago, quite a few years ago. And then we do have a, an up-to-date database on our site as well. We are also involved in State Records Management and Preservation Board, and that is a board comprised of county officials as well as some state officials who help develop retention schedules, sign off on uh, destruction of records when their time has uh, been reached that they can be destroyed, or in some cases they get transferred over to us. So there's different things with that. They also do grants. We collect money through recording fees collected by all of our county clerks. And then we do grants back to the various county uh, agencies and offices if they're trying to digitize things, if they need to buy shelving, better boxes, different projects like that. So uh, we are constantly trying to work with all of our county officials to see if we can help make things go better for them. History Bowl is a, a big thing that we have been involved in. In West Virginia, when you're in the eighth grade, as well as the fourth grade, you take West Virginia history as your social studies class. and We've done this now for 10 years. We got interrupted, of course, this year uh, when we were preparing, but this is actually a shot from the 2019 state final. And uh, I believe the team on the, the right there the, in the maroon shirts, they're going to be the ones who ultimately win. But it is a quiz bowl style thing where we have a round with a buzzer that teams ring in, and then we have an alternating question round. And we do 60 questions, hopefully, in uh, – 10 minutes and it it's really intense with some of these schools it's been a lot of fun we we go out and travel around the state to the different regions as the preliminaries and then everybody comes to charleston for the state finals and i actually ended up moderating that round uh which i don't normally do at states usually i'm serving more as a judge and running all over the place helping with stuff we also have the west virginia veterans memorial this was originally uh dedicated in 1995 the actual origins of this project had been to create a memorial for Vietnam veterans. But one of the uh, artists who submitted a proposal decided, you know, let's spread this out and make this the whole 20th century. And it really captured the attention of the folks that were doing the planning on this. And they thought this is a great idea. So there are four sides to this. You see the World War II sailor looking at you from this side. World War I has a statue of the, the Army Doughboy. Uh, Korea has a aviator in his flight uniform and Vietnam has a Marine. And so inside each of these on the marble, we have the names carved of all of the people who were killed or died during the period of conflict who were from West Virginia. And so that is um, one of the projects that I'm involved in trying to keep it updated, trying to add more information to it. Uh, we, we have a database that you can search. I, searched on Cornelius Charlton just as an example. He is a Medal of Honor winner uh, from the Korean War who was killed during the war. And then when you would click on his name, it would bring up a database detail like this that gives us some information, you know, where he's from, what his rank and, and service unit were, uh, the date of death and where, where he is buried, which in this case is in Arlington, his unit, where he was born, information about his family, and then we also have been writing biographies. We have a retired uh, English professor from West Virginia State University who's been coming in and working with high school students here in our local community to write bios of a lot of these guys. And so when we can come up with pictures, we do that. Uh, Charlton also has a bridge named after him down on the West Virginia Turnpike. Uh, so I thought he was a good example to pull up. Uh, Civil War medals. We uh, we were a divided state, and of course, we become a state during the Civil War. But after the war in 1866, the state had three styles of medals cast for people who had served within the West Virginia Union regiments, not the Confederates. The majority of them were honorably discharged medals, but there were also the medals, and I jotted down my notes on this, I was reading them. We have killed in battle, and then we had for liberty. And the, for liberty were people who died either of wounds, of just, um, but around the edge of the medal is carved the, or engraved the name of the person and their unit. So each medal is personalized. And those were transferred over to us 
back, I think, in the about the the 80s, perhaps, because we ran an article in West Virginia history at that time about the history of the medals and about who we still had medals for. And that was about the time I joined the staff and our phone was just ringing off the hook with people calling, saying, I see so and so's name on here. You know, how do I go about applying? We still have about 4000 of these left. And so folks can fill out a form. Uh, you know, they have to show us their lineage back to this person does not have to necessarily be a direct line, but they've got to be able to give us the documentation from themselves back to whichever parent, from that parent back to the proper grandparent and trace it on back. Um, and then we have a six month waiting period just to be sure nobody with a closer relationship claims it, which at this point I don't think has become too much of an issue. And then they are sent out to the person claiming them. Uh, we have the list online of who we still have medals for and what units they served in. And of course, links there about how to get the application form. Um, Randy Markham, who is our staff person who deals with it, you know, if there's a question about it, Randy's a good one to email and uh, see whether he can help you figure it out. The War Militia Cards, we have a lot of records. This was from a militia unit in Marion County. Uh, will give me, you know, the name of someone, when they enrolled, uh, you know, so for folks that are doing research either on an ancestor or on a particular unit, because a lot of people are still doing uh, Civil War histories, these can be interesting and useful. We have also um, microfiche of World War I service cards. They give us, this is not a great copy, but then again, the microfiche is not the best either, because uh, it's just a tiny little index card, basically. And it tells us who the person was, their date served, if they served overseas, uh, if they were wounded or killed, uh, where they were from, potentially in West Virginia, and then sometimes there's an additional, like the application for victory medal card that you sort of see there in the middle. Uh, we have a lot of World War II military discharge records, and those also are on microfiche. Uh, this was actually the father of, of someone that I, I know from scouting, and he was trying to get a copy of it after his dad had died so that he could get a military stone placed for it. So we have things like that. We don't come up too much beyond World War II. For anything more recent, we're usually not going to have a great deal on that. But folks find this very useful. And I've actually got somebody that I suspect is overseas who's been asking about World War I records, trying to find a researcher who could come in and look for about four or 500 names. I'm not sure what his project is entailing, but uh, we're going to work with him on that. We have uh, – a lot of our books are in an electronic card catalog system like this that we share with the State Library Commission, which also shares our building. I understand that they have a new contract and that this is going to be changing later this year. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that's going to affect us exactly. Hopefully everything we've already got put in there will stay. But it will do things. It will tell us, for instance, the call number for our book, if we have different versions of it, uh, and, of course, the basic bibliographic information. The Hatfields and McCoy feud is a big topic in our state because the Hatfields lived on our side of the river while most of the McCoys lived over in Kentucky. But it's still a very thought after research topic. And uh, so we get a lot of queries and questions about that. On our History Center, we have different types of topics that you can look at and see information about things. If you want to know, you know, information about counties, you can click on that. We have different topics, edu education things, things about Native Americans, um, transportation, uh, just different topics. John Brown is a big topic for us because of his raid up at Harper's Ferry and because we have the Boyd Stutler collection, which has a lot of original John Brown materials and things relating to him and his um, associates at the time. And so we have a lot of different things there. Students will find this very useful. Uh, it just depends on what folks interest is. Our counties, and this is one of the things that I sent you as an attachment. It shows you all of our counties, gives you the date that it is formed and tells you what counties it is formed out of. And that's very important because a lot of times you may need to go back to those earlier counties if you're looking for some types of records. Virginia did not require counties to keep birth or death records until 1853, which is a real problem for a lot of folks doing research because you have trouble making those connections before that. 
But marriage records will generally go back to the founding of the county, and a lot of times so will deeds and wills. So you may not be able to find the, the birth or death, but sometimes you can get it through a different angle like that. Um, you know, we know it makes it very difficult because we know the 1850 census is the first one to lift up, list everybody out in the household, and it just makes it a lot harder for you when you're trying to do this research. But this, you know, I've got, I had done the slide in three things, and then when Suzanne had mentioned handouts, I thought this was going to be definitely one to send out. And occasionally, some of the predecessor counties are counties that are still part of Virginia, and so we don't have their records. But we certainly will help you in, you know, getting in touch with them if it turns out to be something like that. I pulled up what the resources would start to show you for Hampshire County because that is our oldest county. It was created in 1754. And so we have various books on it. Uh, there will be articles about it. There will be clippings. And so you can you can find different things depending upon what you're looking for on a given county. Some counties are going to have more information than others. It, it just varies from county to county. We also have a lot of records on microfilm, and this is the listing for Hampshire that, again, records that were at the county courthouse that the Genealogical Society of Utah filmed. Births and deaths in that county don't start until 1865, 1866. That's because Romney, which is the county seat, changed hands something like 50 times during the Civil War. And a lot of those records got lost or destroyed. And so uh, you'll find that with some counties. Some counties have had courthouse fires. They've had floods. So we may not always have the records that go back to the actual founding of the county, but Generally, this was what was available at the time when the Mormons were here in the late 60s doing the microfilming, and they tried to film as much as they could of things that were in book form. They weren't at that time trying to do a lot of loose records. When they came back in the late 80s, early 90s, they went back to some of the counties and did some loose things, also some circuit court records. So uh, that let us get some naturalization records as part of it. But we have different things like that. Um, our guide to collections, if you're looking for county records on microfilm, if you're looking for manuscripts, you can go into these different subtopics and do searches on different things. Um, naturalization records, we are lucky enough we have some on microfilm, some in original form, and in some cases we have both because it was still at the courthouse when the filming was done, and then the county or circuit clerks have decided to go ahead and give us the original records. And so we have a lot a lot of naturalization records, and we had a lot of immigrants coming into our state, particularly in the early part of the 20th century, a lot of, of Italians, a lot of Irish, a lot of folks from Slavic nations. And right now we're seeing um, a lot of interest in people getting dual Italian citizenship. So they will contact us and we will need to copy these things and get them. We have to go through a process with our Secretary of State's office. It's It's complicated, and it's not something I do too often, but... Oftentimes, the records will give us a certificate of arrival telling us that this person arrived in New York City in 1909. Um, he filed his declaration of intention, and many times they will have a small snapshot attached to them, which people find to be just a wonderful resource. Uh, after the period of time elapses, they file their petition for naturalization. And again, it goes back into, you know, where they are born and raised. Uh, who their parents were when they arrived in the United States. A lot of good information when you're trying to track through this. Uh, this particular person had a certificate of loyalty form attached to his as well. This was someone that we had had an inquiry on a few weeks ago, and so one of my staff members was taking the book apart that these were bound into or, or put into to, to do it, and I said, why well, you've got that apart? Make me copies of these, please. This would be very good for me to use. Of course, we have a lot of coal mining in the state, and unfortunately, we also had a lot of fatal accidents. Some of them were big disasters with explosions where hundreds would be killed. A lot of them tend to be one or two people. You know, it's a roof fall or something derails down in the mine and they get trapped. So we have forms for some periods of time that actually tell us what happened with the accident. Was the person married? How many children they might have had? A little bit of information sometimes that can be helpful. Um, as time goes on, we get both state and federal accident reports that go into much greater detail about what happened and why they were killed. 
We have newspapers on microfilm. I pulled up the Wheeling page just because Wheeling was our first capital. We actually bounced back and forth between Wheeling and Charleston a couple times before the capital permanently stays here in Charleston starting in 1885. But when we separated from Virginia in 1861 because we did not want to go with them when they seceded from the Union, Wheeling was the second largest city in Virginia at that time. And because of the Ohio River going through there, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad ran through there, the National Road ran through there as it headed west. So that became our our capital for what they at that time called the restored government. And so we have the Wheeling Intelligencer going back to 1852 on microfilm in many cases. And that does tend to be our go-to newspaper when we're doing Civil War research. We have telephone directories. A lot of people will come back looking for that, trying to figure out, you know, where did my grandparents actually live? Uh, I'd like to, you know, see if the house is still standing or we will get people trying to trace a business. What dates do you have for directories and does it show the business being in a particular location? Of course, they don't publish a lot of telephone directories now. And I know for younger people, it's kind of, you know, what are these weird things? Because we'll bring them out and show them to school groups and they're kind of like, yeah, maybe my grandparents have one of these tucked away in the house. But we do have a, an, a fairly decent collection of those going back. Um, you mentioned yearbooks in your introduction. We have, I don't know, six, seven thousand volumes probably. There was a a gentleman named Woodrow Clay Hamilton Jr. who had been collecting yearbooks about West Virginia schools pretty much most of his life. And he eventually got to a point where I think his wife finally said, I think it's time we find another home for all of these books. So he donated his collection to us, which became the basis of us getting other things in from folks. We've gotten some in from schools as they have closed. We've gotten them in from county school boards. We've had people who pick them up on eBay or at flea markets and send them to us. Um, folks will be cleaning out their parents or their grandparents' home and send them to us. So we have a nice run of yearbooks for mostly high schools and colleges, but we have a handful of middle schools, a couple of elementary schools. Um, we try to keep re reasonably current with some of these, too, although sometimes those are the harder ones for us to find. With our genealogy corner, we have a lot of links here that you can click on. We have a genealogy surname exchange where you can click and see if other people have been working on your that particular name and you can get in touch with them. Our archives and history newsletter that we have put out over the years has a lot of articles about different things. I know we have gone into detail in some issues about courthouse fires at different times or about trying to do research on this topic or that topic. Uh, County formations, of course, as I say, was it very uh, important for us to know where to go. Researching your Civil War ancestor or your Revolutionary War ancestor. This gives you some hints and help with some of that. Um, different other sites that aren't ours that may be of benefit, like um, RootsWeb, for instance, or GenWeb, or different files of that nature. So the Vital Research Project, that has been a big thing that we got involved with. Oh, gosh, I can't even remember now how many years it's been. It seems like it's been quite a while. And I did send out the quick guides for birth, deaths and marriages as one of the attachments. This was something we were doing in conjunction with the, um, again, the Genealogical Society of Utah, where they came to us and they said, we'd really like to do this. And we'd kind of like to use you guys as an experiment because we're you know, we're a small enough state and it was a small enough time period. So they actually digitized the records from their microfilm and then they got volunteers to index them. And then we are hosting the images and the index information. Um, over the years, I have found that there were some things that were skipped. And of course, we've found a lot of things that needed to be corrected. Uh, and because I have been working from home at least part of the time since mid-March, that's one of the things I have been trying to do some work on. But you can pick your type of record that you want to select. And if you picked death records, for instance, it brings up a field like this. You can you do not have to put both a first or a last name. You can just put one or the other. You can pick a county or not. Uh, you can pick a range of, of years or not. And over on the right, you'll see sort of a listing of, okay, for this particular county, these are the dates that we have in here. And you'll notice as you look at a lot of these things, many counties are missing some or all of the Civil War years. Again, it was just the chaos of the different 
activities going on, guerrilla groups coming in and out, um, records being destroyed at the courthouse or being taken home by somebody to try and save them and then getting destroyed. It just varies from county to county what our problems are. But what I picked for one to look at is Hank Williams. This is the famous Hank Williams, the singer, who died, was found dead in the back of a car as he was traveling to a concert here in West Virginia. And you will get two hits for him because in 1917, the state starts to issue birth and death records. So we have both a state certificate for him. And unfortunately, it didn't show me the entire field or the whole thing when I brought it over. But we have both his state death certificate and then we have his county death record. And it goes across two pages many times. Um, let me back up to that one a minute. But it tells us, you know, he was died from a heart condition. He was only 29. Oak Hill is where they discovered that he was deceased. Uh, so, you know, I had kind of picked him as a famous person. And I hear thunder in the background. So it sounds like the thunderstorms are moving in a little sooner than they thought. Marriage records, you can pick, you can search on either the male or the female side of it. And uh, I had picked the Faust name because I married a Faust whose grandparents were here in West Virginia. You have to look at these records, though, sometimes with a little bit of, okay, maybe they weren't quite writing this down correctly because his grandfather did not spell Ernest with an A in it. But this was his grandparents' marriage record. Uh, they were from Pleasance County, which is one of our counties up the Ohio River. Got married in 1917. Um, since I am not from West Virginia, I can't go back and pick any of my own family things like this. But one of the things, and I'm going to back up a second just to show you something. When you go to any of our search boxes for birth, deaths, or records, you can also use the asterisk as a wild card. If you weren't sure, for instance, if somebody was a William or a Williams or a Williamson, you could type out the W-I-L-L-I-A-M and put an asterisk, and it would bring up all of those. Or if you didn't know whether somebody spelled read, for instance, R-E-E-D or R-E-I-D, you could put R-E asterisk D, and it'll bring both sets up, as well as anything else that fits within those parameters. So sometimes you might want to do a broad search, and then if it's too broad, you could go back and start narrowing it down if you have an idea of the county or some sense of a range for the death and things to try and look up some of those materials. Let's go back down past marriages now. Uh, births, I um, didn't do the search screen, but this is a birth record. The third person down on this is Jennings Randolph, who was one of our senators for a very long period of time. We actually ended up getting about Oh, 800 boxes worth of his papers when he retired from the Senate. They originally had gone back to Salem College up in Salem, uh, West Virginia, which is where he was from originally. And the college finally decided this was just a little more than they could deal with. And so they got transferred down to us. So uh, Jennings is one of our topics of research. But it goes across, again, a two-page thing. It tells you his place of birth. His father was named Ernest Randolph. He was an attorney and his mother was Idell Randolph. He was, you know, only one child at birth. And then usually it's either the father or the mother who was reporting it to the county clerk's office. The trouble with county records is that a lot of times for births and deaths, people didn't make that trip to the county courthouse. And so they don't show up in the records and folks will get in touch with us and say, why can't I find such and such? Well, because it was never recorded in the first place, unfortunately. Uh, particularly during the flu epidemic of 1918, 1919. We know a lot of people who died who were never show up on either the state or the county side of it. We have a lot, we've done a lot over the years with educators and with trivia type things. On this day in history, we've been doing a lot of document based exercises. So you can search these based on different topics if you're interested in learning more about the state's history. Uh, we've done exhibits over the years in a photo gallery outside of our library, and we've actually been able to put those up on our website as we have taken them down. And so we did one several years ago about transportation in the mountain state. So I picked a couple of images out of this. This is the Wheeling Suspension Bridge, which actually goes back, I believe, to 1854 or 56. This picture is obviously taken probably in the late 20s. Um, but that bridge is actually still standing, although they are doing some work on it right now to try and stabilize it because they had a oversized vehicle try to go across it and it did some damage. New River Gorge Bridge down in Fayette County. 
uh, is on the back of the state quarter for West Virginia. This is the beginning when they are starting to build out across it. And I just find it fascinating that you're building from both sides to try and meet in the middle. And then eventually, of course, the road decking is going to go on top of that. So we have a lot of things in our photo collection. You also mentioned your YouTube channel. We have done a lot of things over the years and put them up on our YouTube channel as well for the archives. There, Our introduction is up there. We have our playlist. We've had a lot of talkers over the years, speakers who have talked about genealogy. And so their different lectures are up here. And you can click on it, listen to the whole thing. And, I mean, some of them will run for an hour and a half, two hours almost on different topics. We've done a lot of historical lectures. Uh, running the gamut of all types of topics. I mean, from flintlock rifles to our food heritage to one that was very interesting in American and Madras. There was a filmmaker who was from the Northern Panhandle who ended up living in India before and after World War II. And he was making a lot of um, a lot of movies over there on different topics. And there was a a gentleman from India who had been researching him, who came over here, did a documentary about him, and then came over here and presented that one evening uh, to our folks in our library. So we have different topics on things of that nature. Um, this is our mailing address with our contact information and our phone number and such. And I have my, uh, let's see, I have my email address here as well if folks have questions. I know that I'm throwing an awful lot at you in a short period of time, and I know every state is different. So uh, I'm most happy to take a lot of questions if I can figure out how to get out of my PowerPoint on the screen and bring up our web page. Uh, and Suzanne, you're probably going to have to help me figure out how to get back to the chats and the questions and such, but I'm most happy to try and field any questions you all might have. Okay. Um, all you have to do is click on the sh quit, share, uh, quit sharing your screen icon. Let me go back and try and here you are. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I can see so you now. I'll, I'll invite the class uh, to see if anyone has got some questions here. Uh, let's see here. Like some chat. Uh, let's see. I have third cousin removed. Uh, oh, Todd says he has a third cousin six times removed to the abolitionist uh, John Brown. Well, that's kind of interesting. Yes. Thank you, Todd. That's a real interesting uh, while the class is, is thinking about questions they might like to type into the chat room, I have a couple things that I'd like to, to further expand on. Um, sure. Your, uh, your microfilm room um, reminds me a lot of, of uh, the Family History Library at Salt Lake City. <laughs> <laughs> and have, you, and have you ever been to the Family History Library in Salt Lake City? I have not, no. No, I've not. not. It's got literally rows upon rows upon rows of, of microfilm cabinets. Uh, it's it's almost overwhelming when you get there, and uh, they too have the more modern machines where you can digitize, you know, the film as it goes through and capture it on your yeah. on your memory stick. So I, that kind of brought back memories of uh, Salt Lake City. Um, and what is your I, at the beginning of your presentation when you were showing all those wonderful videos that you have uh, stored? Is there any plans to digitize those? Not in their entirety. No, uh, that would. <laughs> Just trying to do it would be such of a challenge, much less the storing it, which is an issue we're already running into. Uh, our vital records images, for instance, are on a server that is a couple of years out of date of past its useful life. And so we're trying, we're, it's actually something we're working on, and I found out this morning I'm going to have a Monday afternoon meeting. There's some discussion where our state office of technology is wanting us to pursue the cloud as storage. And that's all well and good to a certain extent, but it makes us nervous to think that something might only be stored in the cloud and what happens if the cloud disappears or, um, you know, we go through some kind of horrendous budget time and we can't afford to keep our stuff there. So we are still backing things up on external hard drives. We actually bought ourselves a media safe a few years back that we're storing original hard drives because, for instance, our governors now, when they leave office, I used to get boxes of photographs, and I would get notebooks with negatives and contact sheets. Now I get a hard drive. And the pictures are very small in many cases, but then sometimes they'll have a larger one if it's one they've uh, used for a particular event or something. And so we're making a backup copy that we pull off the shelf if somebody comes in doing research, and then we're sticking that original one in the vault 
And one of our staff people, she takes them out periodically. She runs checksums and things that go totally over my head about trying to make sure that nothing has changed on those original drives. And um, with the Vital Records Project, it was originally on a server that was in our building, and they had a problem with that server that nobody knew about for a while. And so when it crashed, I found out I'd lost about seven months' worth of what I had uploaded to it, and not to mention any corrections or changes that I had made. So now when I make changes, for instance, if somebody gets in touch with me and says, hey, you know, whoever was trying to interpret this handwriting couldn't figure out what they were looking at, but I know the name should be this. And I go back and I look at it and I go, yeah, I can see that. Um, I fix it in the database, but then I'm also keeping a running list as a Word document of all the changes I make, what role and page number it was on so that, heaven forbid, if the database should ever crash, I could reload it and make all those thousands of changes again, although that might be the thing that pushes me over the edge into retiring. But um, <laughs> it's something I've been working on a lot from home. And, and some of my fellow staff members have taken home lists of things where we've had some problems, you know, maybe a last name should be this or that. And so I could give them some pages and say, you know, go home, take a look at these, see what you think, because some of it is knowing what some of these surnames are. And I've been working through Logan County marriages. Well, there are a lot of people whose last name is Dingus, but that is getting misinterpreted probably 20 different ways. And so I'm literally page by page. I've taken about 10 years worth of them and I'm going through them and I'm coming to the end of what I had printed out to work on and realizing I probably need to print some more out. But it's, <laughs> it's something I can bring home and work on. Uh, you know, I, I can't haul home stuff I have on two floors worth of our building. But I can bring on a list of names I need to correct and go go through them on our database. Yeah, it's really good for my students to understand uh, how important an archivist job is. I mean, you know, it makes the difference between being able to find something and not being able to find something. So that's a very, very wonderful point. Um, let's see here. Oh, uh, you know what? You mentioned the historical markers. Um, I've always yes. wondered so who who is responsible for those markers. You know, and and. Uh, a lot of them look so old when you drive by them, you wonder if anyone's even keeping up with them anymore. So it's wonderful to hear that, that your office is. In our state, we we maintain them when one periodically will get destroyed because it's, you know, somebody has a car accident and hits it. Uh, sometimes we have to have the whole marker recast. There's still a company in Ohio that can make them. And then we work with our different district offices from the Department of Highways to actually get them installed. And then folks... Uh, there have been different groups that around the state who have gone through. There have been a lot of motorcyclists who will travel the state, stop and take current pictures of them and send them to us. And uh, when we're out and about, sometimes if there's a question about a marker, we'll try and kind of make a little side trip and look for them, too, and take pictures to bring back. So markers, I'm, I've helped with that regard. I've not really it's one of the few things I've managed to avoid over the years being technically responsible for. Um, when the person who had been doing it several years ago left, he was doing markers and history bowling, and so I was sort of given my choice, and I said, I'll take history bowl for a year, because <laughs> uh, I was still, my sons were still in school at that age, so uh, I was sort of relating to eighth graders. Um, I think my younger son was a ninth grader the first year we did it, so he wasn't eligible, but uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've gotten to meet some great kids who are very interested in learning these things. And it's it's been a lot of fun working with it and traveling around the state to the different regions to uh, to work with them. Oh, that's wonderful! I mean, to get to all 55 counties, it took me a while, but I have I have been in every county that we have, and uh, that was kind of nice when I marked my last county off, just to be able to <laughs> say I've done it because it it takes you know for us to go to the Eastern Panhandle where Harper's Ferry and Martinsburg and things are that's five hour drive, and usually you're going through another state to get there. Uh, because it's easier that way. So, you know, it's it's not always the easiest. We still have a lot of places that aren't all that easy to get to sometimes. Well, archivists and librarians are very dedicated to the cause. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you mentioned the biography project. Uh, my class has volunteered for, you know, uh, many different projects, like uh, indexing the uh, LDS uh, non-indexed records. Um, mm -hmm. Is this a, your biography project that is being headed up by your, I think you said it was a college professor who had, had uh, retired? She's a, she's a volunteer that's a retired professor, yes. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have Pat McClure working on this with us for years. 
So if you have students that would be interested in, a, in something like that, they can shoot me an email and I can put Pat in touch with them. And then they work with the information we've got. Some of them do further research uh, to try and write up a little bit of a biography about some of these folks that we've lost during the different wars. Uh, and then we will have family members get in touch with us that will have found us on the website and say, you know, I have a picture if you want a copy or I can send you more information. So we're constantly updating that database. It's another thing I've been working on. We had a lot of them. We had no idea where they might have been buried. So I've been spending time going through find a grave and uh, finding, you know, sometimes it may just be a marker stone because they actually went down in a ship in the Pacific or they were in a plane crash that was never recovered. But, you know, there is a stone somewhere memorializing them often in a family cemetery or a national cemetery. I would encourage my students to reach out if that's something that you're interested in doing, because as we all know, uh, we all depend on volunteering uh, to make genealogy either free or very low cost. Uh, and without volunteers, that wouldn't be possible. And we all reap the benefit of, of other people's volunteer time. So, you know, giving back to that community is something that I, you know, would highly recommend. Uh, yes. Also, oh, your, your, Civil War medal, your Civil War medal program, I cannot tell you how impressed I was at that. I mean, giving the Civil War medals back to the, the families that they belong to, that is, yes. wow. I mean, I, I was just floored on that. So I commend you for such a wonderful program. I think what had happened at the time when they did it is a lot of the soldiers had perhaps moved on to other places so when the state first had them cast, they weren't living where they had been at the time they had enlisted. And so, or in some cases, of course, they had died. And so uh, it was publicized, but not perhaps to the extent it could have been. Uh, the, the Grand Army of the Republic had done a lot of work back in the 1890s. They had published up a little booklet with all of the names. But, you know, folks had moved on and such. And so this way, we're a lot of the folks are not West, in West Virginia now because the, the family has gone from the state. But um, you're not doing us any good sitting in a file cabinet upstairs locked up. And folks have really appreciated. Some folks have actually made the trip here to get it in person. We mail them registered mail because we want to be able to track them. But, you know, we've had folks who will say, I will make the trip when my six month deadline is up and come in and. And a lot of times my boss will try to be here to present it. Uh, my boss has written a few books on the Civil War, so he's always thrilled to be able to do something like that with folks. Um, the different members of our staff, we, we all have kind of different areas of expertise and interest. And so Randy, who does our Civil War medals, well, he's also our Hatfield-McCoy expert. So when we get a research question dealing with the Hatfield-McCoys and the feuds, uh, we tend to, to buck that one to Randy because he knows the people to put them in touch with. Uh, if we don't have somebody on staff that can help them with something, a lot of times we'll know folks here locally in the community or in the state that may be of some help to them, and we can put them in touch with the right people. And we, we still, some of our retired people, we still email. <laughs> Go, hey, you know, I have this question, and maybe you can help me. And, oh, yeah, you know, so it, we're, we're sort of family in some ways at the archives. And, and once you've been there, you kind of always seem to be there. You know, the one thing as a genealogist we can all appreciate is uh, somebody at the local area where the history actually happened, knowing the, the history of the area and knowing the names, the family names, you know, knowing the yes. important events that shaped the lives of your ancestors at the time. So I, I can't underestimate uh, it by any means the importance of uh, when you do reach out, look for somebody who is knowledgeable of the, of the local area. And you usually don't have to go too far past, like you said, the archives. Uh, for the area or the library for the area. You know, a lot of the librarians, uh, you know, have been there with the county system for many, many years, and they know, you know, exactly what you know, the history of that county is, and, and oftentimes a lot of the family names for that county. So uh, point well taken, very, very well taken. Um, and I don't know how it is out in, in your area, but we are finding many of our genealogical societies, our historical societies are disbanding because the younger people don't seem to be getting involved as much, and the ones who have been running it for the last 30 or 40 years are aging out, are passing away, are moving out of state to be closer to their kids. And so our list of genealogical and historical societies that we have on our website is much smaller than it would have been even 10 years ago. Um, and one thing we have noticed with school children coming through with groups and things, we'll pull some original records to show them. A lot of them can't read cursive handwriting. <laughs> because um, 
so much of our material, not, not just the genealogy, but so much of our material is handwritten in cursive handwriting. And if you can't read it, it's you don't know what it's saying. And it's not the kind of thing that you're ever going to be able to scan everything you've got and have it magically converted to text. So we talk with the kids when they come through, you know, we'll do, different school groups will come through and it's. It worries us. Uh, you know, most of us are parents. We've got a couple grandparents on the staff and things. And and we do worry about the younger generation not being able to read this history. We've been taking in a lot of county records over the last few years as the courthouses run out of space. They'll they'll look back and they'll go, yeah, would you like the old court cases, um, say, from the, the beginning of the county up to 1900 or up to 1950? In some cases, we've been taking them. And so we'll get in all these cases, and we've had a lot of interest up in the Mid-Ohio River Valley. They're doing a lot of uh, things with gas wells and fracking and needing to go back and track property ownership. And so I have had lots of requests from a couple of different companies that are doing title research on those types of things, where they need us to scan a case from Pleasance County from the 1890s because it helps them figure out who the property owners today are going to be that they need to be getting in touch with. So it, it's been interesting taking in a lot of those county records, but they take up an awful lot of space. And like a lot of institutions, you know, that's a concern for us that we're going to run out of room in our building. Um, we've already moved a little bit of stuff over to the other side of the building with the library commission and have what we call the cage, a fenced in area that we can lock. We probably got a thousand boxes over there right now, some of the county records, just because we don't get into them that often. But um People will ask us, do you think you're ever going to digitize everything you've got? And it's like, I don't see how we ever could. I don't think that, you know, none of us are going to live long enough to do something like that. It's an interesting idea, but um, realistically, I don't see it happening, at least not in my lifetime working there. Sad, but I understand. Um, all libraries and all archives face the same question, space, you know, storage and space. Mm -hmm. Um, space is always a commodity, and it's it's the first thing to get reallocated, you know, when there's uh, a need for it, you know, outside of the archives and outside of the library, so I can definitely relate. You know, a lot of universities are now, uh, because they've run out of space in their libraries, a lot of universities are are storing their books, uh, or at least a portion of their books, off-site in warehouses, uh, you know, just simply to, to be able to um, cope with the, the need for space without having to rebuild onto the building, the existing building. And that's a scary thought because then things happen because people aren't there or you have, um, you know, a roof leak or whatever goes wrong. And then you've got a lot of damage and we we get queries from that. I mean, we've even in my time there, we've gone through a couple of courthouse fires. And, you know, where do you start trying to help them salvage some of this? Because there's just depends on how extensive it's been. We've had floods. Uh, we had a massive flood back in 1985, and I spent a couple of days calling every courthouse in the counties that were affected, which were probably well over half of them, trying to find out, you know, did you have water in the courthouse? And if you did, whose offices were impacted and things? We didn't lose much out of that, fortunately, um, but it was a horrific time. If you ever get a chance to look at the University of Nevada Reno Library on on that campus, um, they have a uh, an ingenious storage method. Uh, they they have the middle of the building hollowed out. It's I think it's like if I remember right, it's like three stories high, and their mm -hmm. storage is all in the core of the building, and it's it's all controlled by a robot. And so when somebody wants a book that's not on the shelf, on you know outside the peripheral, the core of the building. Um, the robot, and you can watch it, they have windows where you can watch the robot go and pull the book, and it just goes up, you know, or over, you know, it's just all uh, automated, and it, it retrieves the book and puts the book away after you're done with it. it it's pretty incredible if you have a chance wow. to look at the website. They, they actually have a video clip of it on their website. Might have to take a look at that. I have been to Reno once long, long ago. Um, my husband's mother was actually from Sacramento. And his parents had met during the war when his dad was stationed out in California. And so after we had gotten married, we had kind of gone out there to so I could meet that side of the family and things. And we did a side trip over to, to go to Nevada for a couple of days. But that's been a while ago. <laughs> okay, let's see here. We, have a couple, we have a couple of comments in the chat box from, from the class. Let's see here. Todd okay. says uh, digitizing documents is something that a robot could be designed to do. Uh, might be time to contact Elon Musk to see what he can do. 
Uh, and then uh, Louise, Louise says, um, I hope you charge uh, business for your research. Uh, they do this, uh, they do this profits and your library needs funds. Great presentation. So uh, that brings yes. to the next question. Uh, if somebody contacts you, do you charge or, or do you do this for free? No, we, we charge. We, um, if you come into the library and you want to just make photocopies, it's a quarter page for normal copies. Um, or it's a quarter page if you want to make copies off the microfilm. And if we do 11 by 17, or I guess it's 11 by 14, they're 50 cents a copy. Um, if it's something bigger, like if we're going to have to, well, I don't have to take it downtown now as much as I used to for maps or blueprints because we have a machine in-house that can do some limited, but we would have to charge it for that. We charge for photos. If people write us research letters, if it's a very, what we call a simple request like, my grandfather died on this date, and I'd like a copy of the obituary where there's not much research. It's more a case of getting the right roll of microfilm out, putting it up, and making the copy. Um, I think it's 5 and $7, whether you're in-state or out-of-state. If, uh, if it's going to involve research, if it's like, I think my grandparents lived there, you know, in the, in the early 1900s, but I don't know where. I don't know anything about it. We, we will charge, it's, I think it's, 10 and 20 dollars whether it's in state or out of state that gets you up to a half an hour's worth of time and up to 10 copies and then if it gets into more copies we will bill you additionally when i have to get into these court cases for a company there really isn't any research because they've already looked at the list and told me the, the thing but yeah sometimes it's three or four hundred copies so they get billed for the copies and also if we get into what we call extensive copy projects like that we charge them 20 dollars an hour for staff time after the first half hour so we are getting a little bit of money back for that. I mean, it's certainly not enough to run our agency on. Uh, with photographs or with documentaries, we have usage fees for using our materials in them, depending on whether it's a, a nonprofit thing or if it's going to be, um, you know, a commercial type publication or, or thing. Public broadcasting, we tend not to charge them. The local television stations, when they come back looking for footage about an old story, we don't charge them for their materials because they're the reason we have them to begin with. They donated them to us when uh, either they switched formats or they ran out of space at the stations. So, you know, they will get in touch with us about things like that. Um, I mean, when, when the History Channel did the Hatfield and McCoy, the feud thing several years ago, they did sort of a little documentary piece to go along with it. And so we provided a lot of materials with that and helped them find some folks to talk to. Um, it, just, it just depends upon the topics. Well, and sometimes we don't have it. I mean, they'll they'll come asking for something that we don't have. And if we can think of someplace else to suggest they try, we'll do that. And they can put my students can put the request in through the email, right, as well. They could they could run it by me like that. And if it's something that we're going to need them to submit a formal research request, I'll tell them that I can I can email them back and let them know that. And email it. Our, we actually have a separate email account set up for the vital records project that goes to a different email box, not mine. That one I can't check remotely. I don't understand why, and sometimes it's just easier not to ask the Office of Technology. But I am in the office at least Mondays and Wednesdays, and a lot of Fridays I've been going in. But today I said, no, I'm going to stay home so I can shut myself off in a room at home and not have any interruptions to be able to do this. So I am monitoring that email when I'm in the office. Now, my normal email account, my deborah.a.basham account, I can access that from home remotely. So, yeah, I can keep up with their questions. If they're not sure about something, I mean, feel free to shoot me a question and, and I'll I'll try to answer it or I'll try to find somebody who can help me answer it. Excellent. OK, uh, let's see here. I had one last comment uh, and I'll give the students one last chance to uh, submit through the chat box any questions they have. But you mentioned food heritage and I, uh, that's something that we've talked about in my class before. Uh, and I wanted to remind everybody in the class that um, we do have several good books at the TMCC library about preserving your uh, family's uh, uh, food heritage and in the form of you know, preserving your genealogy. Uh, and that's something that as soon as the library opens back up again, uh, maybe that it might be a good opportunity to have a class on that topic. Um, I do know one of uh, the people who attends my class is writing a family cookbook right now uh, based on her ancestors' recipes. Uh, uh, some that were you know, handed down with oral tradition and some that were handed down in, in written form. Uh, so it's, it's and I've got, uh, I don't have a lot of family recipes myself. Uh, for some reason they didn't survive. Um, but I, I'm writing a book on my, uh, my family's food heritage based on the China 
that my uh, ancestors have passed down from generation to generation. Because uh, all of my living cousins have their, like, grandmother's china that was passed down to them. And, of course, uh, you know, china is something that has becoming less and less of interest to the newer generations. So preserving that, uh, that china in the form of a book is, is one form of uh, preserving your family's food heritage. Uh, because I can't, you know, just personally, I can't remember Christmas when I was growing up where that china wasn't brought out of the, the cupboard, you know, <laughs> where it was stored all year long. Uh, only for Christmas and Thanksgiving usage. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's definitely something that I think is very worthwhile. Uh, and I, it, I think food heritage preservation is something that is really overlooked, uh, and but is yet equally important uh, to your, preserving your family history. And, and with different regions within our state, um, hot dogs are an interesting topic because there's a dividing line where like a chili dog with everything, you know, if you're on one side of the line, that may include slaw, it may include mustard, but if you're on another side of the line, it doesn't. And so we have areas within the state like that. Pepperoni rolls are very popular. That was something that uh, the story is that an Italian immigrant figured out how to make these because you could stick them in a miner's pail and take them down underground with you and eat them. And so it's pepperoni basically into bread dough, and they will vary some from part of the state to part of the state. Uh, and then, of course, you get the fairs and festivals, you get some of the local food, and it's a lot of fun checking out on some of these things. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, well, I don't see, I see people saying thank you, but I don't see any questions. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to say thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And uh, thank, thank you all for, for allowing us to record the presentation. And as soon as our, our marketing department finishes editing it out, uh, because they, they take out my part of the beginning, the first 15 minutes of class, they take that out, and then the final product will just be your presentation on the YouTube channel. So okay. uh, as soon as I get that link, I will be happy to send it to you with along with the thank you letter, and I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll say thank you on behalf of my class and uh, everybody who is still online. If you want to stay online uh, after uh, our guest speaker signs out, uh, we're going to be talking initially about how to use a code to download all your distant uh, cousin DNA matches uh, because Ancestry.com is going to start eliminating those, uh, those farther away uh, DNA matches. So we're going to be talking about that, and I'll be sharing the code. Uh, so with that, uh, anybody who would like to go ahead and log off, just click on the red hang up button. And once again, uh, Deborah, I really appreciate your time today and your expertise. Well, thank you all for having me. You all stay safe. And uh, enjoy the rest of your, your class here. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>